class time. And I my thanks in advance to those who are still not around here with the hope that they would be coming. Uh, today we have assembled here a framework of our class called Human Rights in Non-Western Societies. And we have amongst us very distinguished members of the panel today to discuss about the subject which is related with the idea of uh, non-discrimination, hate crimes, xenophobia, and a whole set of things, an agenda that comes very close to us. Many of us are on the Facebook, Twitter, talk about it, watch it, see it on the television, feel frustrated about it, but then we kind of move on. As the students of uh, this program, we take special pride in the thing that we don't only move on, we take a pause, observe, ponder, and try to dissect the social anomalies that exist. And that basically brings us, even on the 21st century, in a way that could better be avoided. Uh, what I would really like to do is to, first of all, mention um, and acknowledge with great uh, enthusiasm uh, the critical role that is our students' community, in particular our student chamber of the department has and they have been massively active to ensure that our activity does take place in a very decent manner. So I would really give the floor to the students' chamber and their representative to basically conduct the whole event rather than uh, lecturing down the whole procedure. So let the students run the whole thing. So I will request my friend, Lee, to kind of, if at all, he can say a few words about uh, uh, the, the today's uh, thing and to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Right, uh, thank you for the uh, really warm welcoming. And uh, I really appreciate that you guys came here because this issue of uh, discrimination, xenophobia, and uh, racism, they're actually really, uh, they're, they're considered one of the most uh, heating topics nowadays, especially with the rise of populism. And you know, you have this kind of people, politicians talking about those extremely right-wing ideologies uh, worldwide. It's not a unique phenomenon only to countries like America or, you know, let's say the recent event what happened in Italy. It's also another uh, sign of the rise of populism. And like, you know, as students of public policy, we are actively thinking of like how we could tackle the issue of xenophobia, popul uh, populism, and also um, discrimination and racism in uh, public policy approach. And therefore, I believe that ha by having this panel, we'll have some really uh, great discussion on the issue. And we will be having a lot, a lot more inspirations from the talk and the knowledge that we can gather today. And well, thank you guys for coming. I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. And for today, we have three very distinctive members from different organizations to give us lecture on anti-trafficking, xenophobia, discrimination, and also we have a legal expert from Europe, uh, the Council of Europe, and to give a talk about the legal approach of the uh, of the issue. Thank you. So, so I was just here to start with, we have our panel of uh, experts. We would be starting with Mr. Alexander Varkovsky. And as uh, the initial talk is going to be around for 45 minutes to one hour that he's going to talk at length about the problems which uh, he has encountered as, as, a, as an expert. And uh, there's corrective measures that we as policy science student can learn from that. And then we would be going to the uh, one of the expert who has been uh, practicing this, uh, Mr. Kehinde, he's on his way, and we would have the legal aspect of that being discussed by Ms. Shannon. Thank you, and uh, Mr. Alexander, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, first of all, I have uh, to apologize that my English is not good, in fact, but <laughs> I will try. Uh, our organization uh, is a small NGO-based think tank, I would say. We are researching Russian nationalism, uh, issues of hate crime and hate speech, uh, religion and politics, uh, and what is called uh, anti-extremism law enforcement in Russia, in all aspects of that. Uh, I, sorry, I will have to stand up because... I can help you. Uh, I will just tell you that's, yes. that's our website. I think people hear me anyway. Uh, and there is an English page there for those for oh, oh, it's easier. 
we also have a page there about our books, uh, and almost all of them can be downloaded, um, including the one which I will talk a little more here. I mean, uh, a book uh, with a, which, which I wrote, uh, it's a comparative analysis of uh, legislation related to hate crimes and hate speech uh, in OSC region. Uh, here, of course, I will, will not retell the book, I <laughs> just will, will say some things re related to that. So I will start, uh, I, I, will ju I have just have to, to try to explain how will I just make a structure of the presentation. Yes, First, I will talk a little about uh, ultranationalism here in Russia and how it is related to violence. Uh, then uh, I will turn to legal approaches which are possible and really exist in democratic countries uh, against uh, hate speech and hate crimes, uh, meaning only uh, oh, good, thank you very much. Uh, criminal legislation, uh, because, because there are many different measures here. And then I will turn to Russian practice in this sphere, and I will try to, to make it <laughs> as possible. Uh, first about uh, Russian ultranationalism. Uh, I mean post-Soviet post -Soviet time, of course, only. If we uh, turn to all the time in the 90s, we will see a whole variety of nationalist organizations, uh, but a very low level of street violence and any other politically motivated violence, in fact. Uh, the situation started to change in the end of 90s when the new generation of ultranationalists came uh, to, to the scene. Uh, I mean uh, pure neo-Nazi uh, young groups which were mostly skinheads by the subculture, but uh, uh, first of all they were neo-Nazi and they called themselves national socialists. Uh, and the, they were sure that violence is really a tool to mobilize support for their ideas because, let's say, older nationalists failed to do that with their political approaches. Uh, so we, as a result, we saw a growing level of hate crimes uh, in our country. Uh, I here must show you does it work? It does. Uh, the table which uh, shows our statistics, statistics which Sava Center gather on hate crimes. It's not official. There is no official statistics of hate crime in, in, in the country. Uh, so, of course, it's very far from being full. Uh, but anyway, if you can see numbers, I, I hope it is possible to see them. Uh, it's it's obvious that it was growing in general numbers uh, till the peak uh, around 2008-2009. Uh, and uh, then we see that numbers are declining. How had it happened? Uh, in the beginning of this century, if any police general uh, was asked what what do you plan to do with uh, racist crimes, uh, with the uh, Nazi skinheads? You, the usual answer was that uh, there is not much a problem, it's just youth, some street hooliganism, we do not need any special measures. And it continued for years. Before uh, 2006, uh, when first time this not, not these groups, these groups just participated, but anyway, it happened. In one small town uh, of Russia, if there are R Russians here, maybe somebody even remember the, the name of the town, it's uh, Kondapoga city in the Karelia Republic. Uh, it was a riot in the city. Uh, typical uh, riot against migrants. Uh, and the problem was not in, in some violence, because uh, of course it was violent, but not, maybe it's cynical, but not much. Anybody, any, at least nobody was murdered uh, during the, the riot itself. 
but uh, authorities completely lost control over the city for a couple of days. And that was perceived seriously. Uh, after that, uh, special forces in police were created, so-called Centers for Counteracting Extremism, which uh, received uh, uh, some resources and some training to counteract uh, political radicals, let's say, of, of all kinds. Later, these centers uh, became, uh, let's say, less specialized, and now, they, in fact, they operate as a political police. But uh, it's uh, the achievement that these numbers uh, started to decrease, because uh, on the edge of previous and this decade, they arrested, nobody knows, in fact, how many, but for sure hundreds of violent neo-Nazi and imprisoned them. Uh, and uh, as a result, we see this decline of violence, uh, no, but not only because of that. It was the beginning, but later uh, we saw a big crisis of Russian nationalist movement. It's, it's even visible. If, we, uh, if anybody of you would like, let's say, to visit the main uh, Russian nationalists' public rally, so-called Russian March, on November 4, uh, it's, it happens annually, uh, you will see um, a very small, I would say, meeting. Uh, last time it was maybe 200 people all together uh, marching uh, at the place where previously 6,000 participated. Uh, it's not because of police pressure, it's because we have, uh, in our country, we have rather unusual situation, if to compare maybe to European countries, that we have rather high level of uh, general ethnic intolerance in the country if to, to see any sociological uh, polls, uh, but a very low level of support to any nationalist organizations. And I would say there are two main reasons for that. First, uh, this um, as I said, the, uh, this that relatively new now, it's not, not new, of course, a generation which came in the late 90s, they were neo-Nazi, they were skinheads, they, they looked like skinheads, if you know how the skinheads look. Uh, and for usual Russian citizens, even if they hate all migrants, it was just impossible to stand together with these street hooligans. Uh, and there were no, let's say, respectable enough nationalists in the country. It's a strange deficit, but it, it, that, that's what we have. Uh, and another thing maybe is that uh, most of our citizens anyway, uh, first of all, trust the government. Even if they criticize government and are unhappy with the government, they still trust the government, not in the, but not independent actors including nationalist independent actors. Uh, so now we see the decline of this movement and decline of the violence because uh, new people, young people, because violence mostly is perpetrated by young people, when they come to the movement previously, they had some hopes that if they kill some number of migrants, they didn't uh, hope that uh, because of that migrants won't come. Uh, they were not so naive, but they uh, expected that the general population uh, will be somehow mobilized by the heroic, as they saw themselves, uh, actions. They call usually people imprisoned for hate crimes, uh, white heroes and something like that. Uh, but general population was not mobilized. Uh, and it's a kind of, I don't know, depression among Russian nationalists. Uh, that's good, I would say, but I'm not sure it's for a long time. It's, it, that, that's what we have today. Uh, uh, if we turn to uh, speech, not to violence, uh, of course we have, I will talk about it, we have a lot of legislation against hate, hate speech, mm, but if you just one, want to find 
any kind of racist statements uh, anywhere. You can easily do that, except of uh, major newspapers and TV, of course, because they are under strong censorship and uh, open racism is forbidden. Uh, if they are not under st uh, so strict limitations, uh, I think these journalists will write the same things uh, they usually say <laughs> when they are um, in a private situation. Mm -hmm. what, uh, here I will turn to what generally can be done from legal point of view against uh, such things. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, not a lot, but some international law uh, related to hate speech. What is interesting, there is no uh, clear international obligations regarding hate crimes, but hate crimes laws are really widespread uh, all over, almost all over Europe. Maybe only Netherlands and Estonia do not have any hate crimes law for now. Uh, uh, what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, if the person, what is hate crime by definition? That it's a crime, first of all, which is usually a crime, doesn't matter why and against whom, but uh, it is motivated by hatred or intolerance or any other negative prejudice, I would say, against certain group, against certain, uh, based on some certain bias. Uh, if uh, it's not a crime, uh, it cannot be hate crime. If, uh, and if, you, if the police cannot prove bias, uh, it means that it will be punished just, let's say, usual crime. Uh, so, of course, it's a problem, uh, but, but it works. Uh, it works, and there, there is some research on that, on European experience. Uh, yes, such, such kind of legislation helps to reduce the level of uh, racist violence. It's not about only racist in a pure sense, like uh, white and black. Uh, you standard set of biases which are covered by um, hate crimes laws include any, ki any kind of ethnic difference, uh, citizenship difference, and also some, something related to religion. Language may be different, uh, but I, I will not go into details. But uh, some other uh, biases also may be uh, included to hate crimes legislation, um, gender or sex, depending on, on the country, um, sexual orientation sometimes, um, health, health status uh, in some countries, sometimes even social status, like level of income, it's, it's more problematic because, for example, if somebody just attack uh, and no rob person because he's rich, why did he do that? Because he hates rich people or because just it's more profitable to, to rob rich people than poor people. Uh, uh, but so, so it's not so easy, but um, anyway, it works. As to hate speech, as to, uh, uh, I first have to say that even the term hate speech usually is not used in the law. Uh, international law prescribes us uh, to call it incitement to hatred. Uh, the problem is that there is a lot of commentaries uh, from very, respect, uh, very mm, respectful lawyers, what is incitement? But it's never clearly explained what is hatred. Uh, to what certainly person has to incite, uh, so we could call it incitement to hatred. Uh, is it only incitement to violence uh, based on some ethnic or other difference? No, for sure no. It's not the same because uh, because it's visible from, from the language of international law and from national legislations. It's not only about uh, calls to discrimination, to uh, So incitement to hatred, it's something wider than incitement to any certain action. And it, of course, produces some gray zone, because, uh, of course, no government plans 
to criminalize any manifestation of intolerance. It's just impossible. Uh, so uh, the government, the law enforcement system, has to differentiate somehow what is criminal and what is not. Uh, it's uh, very problematic, uh, and there is a lot of discussion because of that if uh, the incitement of, to hatred uh, legislation uh, have to exist at all. Because the United States, as we all know, uh, has no such legislation because there is a First Amendment to American constitutions which prohibits the Congress to approve any law which limit, uh, limitates somehow freedom of speech. Uh, only direct threat may be criminalized. A personal threat against certain person, a group of persons, uh, but not any kind of general incitement. Uh, so there are many voices also here in Russia that all this uh, legislation on speech has to be abolished. Um, I think this discussion will continue for many years anyway, but for now we have uh, here in Russia and all over Europe, we have uh, strong obligations by uh, already signed and ratified international agreements to have some kind of legislation against um, incitement to hatred. So there is a big discussion among legal experts, international uh, I mean discussion, how to, to make some limits for governments, for national law enforcement systems, uh, for they do not use this legislation too widely. Uh, and there is even a document uh, adopted by such kind of conference of experts and then approved by UN Human Rights Council. Uh, no, it, it's not a law, it's just recommendation. Um, it's called Rabat Plan of Action against, I, I don't remember even the full title, it's very long. Uh, Rabat, because it was approved in Rabat city in Morocco. Uh, experts which uh, produced this document, it's long enough, uh, they first of all say that uh, criminal uh, law enforcement cannot be a primary tool against intolerance and discrimination. Uh, some other things, other tools m must be used first of all, and the criminal law enforcement is, is a last resource with, when nothing else uh, helps. And they write that the language of national law uh, has to be rather clear and strict and closer to international obligations, not using vague terminology. I, I talk about that because soon I will turn to, ra to Russian experience. Uh, that blasphemy laws have to be abolished. And also uh, these experts say that it's impossible, they all agree that it's impossible to write everything in the law itself. The, that limitation on a freedom of speech, which in fact uh, we talk about limitation on freedom of speech, cannot be described in the law in so many, in, in, in enough details uh, to make law enforcement just technical, let's say. So it's, it's a, a big burden on um, judges who have to interpret certain situations. And uh, experts recommend judges to uh, take into account not only what was written or said, but some other things. For example, who said that? Was this person a person of authority? Maybe he was nobody, let's say, and nobody cares what he says. Uh, whom he talked to? If, for example, I, I don't know, inside group of professors of this university to go and uh, kill somebody for racist reasons, it will be, let's say, not very, not much successful. But if I gather a group of young neo-Nazi, maybe I could provoke them if I spoke with the same language. Uh, and numbers also matter. If I speak to or write for 10 persons or 10,000 persons, 
uh, it matters, and the context of the situation matters. So there are many things which have to be taken into account. It's especially important because most of speech, any public speech related to politics, now happens in the internet. <laughs> and in the internet, it's, it's not so easy to understand what, what is the audience. Because in theory, if it's not uh, blocked somehow, anybody can read it. But in fact, sometimes only few people saw the statement uh, if the author is not a popular person. Uh, so there is a variety of, uh, I, will not, I will skip that all, uh, of European laws, uh, but what is maybe important to underline here that uh, there are two, if, if we read all these uh, dozens of laws, we may see somehow two different, overlapping but different uh, approaches uh, for this legislation against incitement to hatred. Uh, first approach is based on prevention of the conflict. Uh, so the purpose of the legislator is to prevent civil war or riots or something like that. Mostly it happens in the country which have bad experience, I mean, in the last decades, not in some previous time. Uh, but in uh, most stable countries, mostly it's about anti-discrimination. Mostly the legislature thinks about incitement to hatred as a tool of discrimination, not as a tool of incitement to uh, instability. Uh, if we turn to Russia, uh, it's, it's interesting that if we just read literally our law, it's also maybe seen as a law uh, protecting persons and aimed against uh, discriminatory behavior. But in fact, if we look at law enforcement, and of course in some certain norms too, we see this uh, approach which uh, supposed to focus first of all on preventing uh, conflicts or, or riots, I know, uprising, whatever. Uh, we, um, in Russia we have a growing number of laws related somehow to hate crimes and hate speech. Uh, not going to, let's say, to the history, we may say that from 2007, we have a whole set of articles of criminal code which includes uh, hatred as a motivation which is aggravation, aggravative, um, um, aggravation for, for, for the basic crimes. And not only for murder, but uh, down to um, just beating person without serious consequences. Uh, so th there, is, there are many tools to classify hate crime as hate crime. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes not. It depends on, of course, on some subjective things, if police officer, certain police officer is interested to do that or not. Uh, so sometimes he put additional effort to, to prove uh, the hate motivation. Sometimes he just skips it. Uh, if we turn to uh, incitement to hatred and other statements which are usually called uh, extremist ones, uh, we will see a variety of articles. And all of them are more or less problematic. That's why, uh, in general, anti-extremism law enforcement is perceived in our society as uh, very problematic. It, e even people who are, let's say, completely loyal uh, to, to, to the government from in political, uh, sense, even, even they usually criticize uh, this law enforcement. So it's, it's a kind of common knowledge that there is a problem here, but uh, I have to say that nobody 
care to, to do something with the problem. The legislation is just extending uh, from year to year. Uh, just briefly, I have just mentioned what we have. We have, uh, first of all, most known Article 282 of Criminal Code. It's Article of Incitement to Hatred. The language generally is more or less the same, I mean language of the article, more or less the same as in many European countries. Nothing very much special here. So uh, the problem mostly is not about the language of the law, but about practice of law enforcement. But uh, I may say that some parts of, of the language maybe provoke, uh, I would say, um, uh, too, too wide uh, law enforcement too. For example, criminalize not only incitement to hatred against people based on race, ethnicity, religion, gender, and so on, but also humiliation of people based on the same biases. But what humiliation is? Is it, is it proper that humiliation is a crime, not, not a civic offense or administrative offense? Why uh, general, uh, in general case, humiliation is not a crime, but uh, if it's related to ethnic hatred, it is a crime. But what is the difference here? Uh, it's, it's not so obvious. Uh, we have incitement to hatred by, against several biases, and some of these biases are mentioned in the article, but there is also one phrase there that also against people related to certain social group. As there is no clear understanding what social group is, uh, in social sciences, of course, there may be debates what kind of group may be called social group and what kind of group cannot. But anyway, uh, these debates are somewhere in other place, not in the court. In the court, uh, prosecutor decides who is social group here. Uh, so mostly uh, it's about police officers, for example, or local authorities, uh, or some political group, in fact, which is called social group. Uh, so it's, it's also a problematic part. We have an article which sounds clear enough on the, on the first glance, like public incitement to extremist activity. The problem is that extremist activity is defined in another law, not in a criminal co uh, code, and is defined extremely vaguely. Uh, for example, statement of religious superiority is an extremist statement. In practice, in the very many cases of uh, our civil practice, in, in civic cases, uh, just statement that my religion is better than yours, uh, is perceived as an extremist statement, uh, which is, of course, may, so any, any believer, in fact, may be accused. Uh, so it means that incitement to, to say so is, a, is already a crime. Uh, and uh, we have such law enforcement. We have much more weird things. Uh, I, I, I even cannot retell them all, but most, most, I just mentioned most strange ones. We have an article which is called Rehabilitation of Nazism. Sounds proper, and even it's according to EU recommendations. Of course, Russia isn't part of EU, but uh, anyway. Uh, but uh, inside this article, it's not only about, uh, we, we read not only about uh, Nazi crimes, uh, we also uh, see that uh, part of the crime, it may be liable against policy of Soviet Union during Second World War. Uh, and uh, th there are already some cases when it was implemented, uh, and obviously against people who did not do anything criminal from I'd say, more or less common point of view. Uh, we have an article of incitement to separatism. Um, it, 
It may be a discussion if it has to be decriminalized or not, but even if it has, uh, we have a very, really very strange explanation from Supreme Court how to implement this article. Uh, the Supreme Court said that if somebody asks for, urge for some illegal measures uh, with the purpose of separatism, uprising, terrorism, whatever, uh, it cannot be classified by this article. It has to be described as an incitement to certain crimes. But if the person incite uh, to, to do something legal with the purpose of separatism, that is a crime according to this article. Um, and it implements this way. And of course, uh, maybe many people know we have an article in the, our court uh, criminalizing uh, abuse, religious feeling of believers, whatever it means. Uh, and we have um, some sentences. Uh, so the law here is problematic. Uh, and how is it implemented? I will show you the second part of our table when we collect data of law enforcement. Uh, it's more difficult to, to read it. Um, I'll try to explain. First of all, uh, it's not the full data. Again, it's, it's about uh, sentences which our center knows. If it's about uh, extremist statements, uh, it's maybe about 40% of, of real numbers. Uh, so we uh, try to, uh, to differentiate between uh, sentences which we see improper, which means the uh, sentence is not based even on the actual law. Uh, some sentences we, when we are not sure, and uh, all others which at least follow uh, the existing law, even if we disagree. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it, uh, the court's decision is based on the law. Uh, if we look um, we see that the number of people convicted for violence, I mean crimes against persons, uh, was very high in certain years and then it decreased. It's, it's natural because the number of hate crimes decreased. Uh, but the number of people uh, sentenced for public incitement of any kind uh, is still increasing. Uh, and uh, in total, according to the data of Supreme Court, during the last three years, we have about 600 people annually sentenced for public statements, uh, what is called of extremist nature, for several articles of criminal code. Uh, why so many? Uh, does it really help? Uh, why so many? I think because uh, when I mentioned this Rabat plan and criteria which experts recommend to use to understand was it a crime really or just some intolerant, maybe rude or you know, nasty words. Uh, all these criteria, uh, criteria are not used in fact. The only way to prove the crime of incitement here is to analyze the text itself. The text or picture or video or whatever, uh, uh, which supposedly insightful, is sent to some experts, usually from linguistics, uh, who find some elements of uh, incitement there, and th that's all. It's, it's the end of investigation. Uh, nobody even tried to understand how big the audience was, while usually it's rather simple to do that. Uh, that's why we have so big numbers. Uh, and uh, how it, has it happened? My only explanation is that uh, maybe it's, there is a bureaucratic reason here, because law enforcement agencies, uh, including police, they report uh, altogether of all crimes of an extremist nature as a sum. So when number of convictions for hate crimes 
started to go down, they had to add something for this. The full sum did not drop down because it, it would show they work less. So they opened more cases uh, for incitement instead of cases or, on violence. And uh, this system, um, uh, if not to change something seriously, cannot just step back because for every regional head of anti-extremism unit, it will be a failure if they uh, investigate less crimes of extremist nature than the previous year. Uh, and if we look uh, at our society, uh, can we say that our society really needs 600 sentences per year for incitement to hatred? I think it's difficult to say what does it mean uh, society needs uh, how to measure that. We cannot say. We can say that maybe we have much more sentences than any European country, uh, but why? Maybe our law enforcement just is more strict and uh, more cares more about tolerance, uh, maybe because of that, or maybe they just work for numbers, as I suspect. Uh, and does it help? Can we see uh, that the level of uh, hate speech uh, is going down. Uh, the problem is that we cannot measure that, in fact. There are no instruments. We have sociological polls which show that the level of ethnic intolerance now is lower than in previous decade. And uh, there is a clear moment when it happened, starting from Ukraine, beginning of Ukrainian war, uh, when, let's say, focus of hatred shifted <laughs> from south to the west. Uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, if to, I, I don't remember who was it, but somebody from this institution, <laughs> as I remember, they even published an article with a, such a graph of uh, negative attitude to the West and negative attitude to uh, ethnic, ethnic, other ethnic groups. And it's, they are clearly symmetrical. If one line is going up, another is going down. So if to summarize these two parameters, it will be a constant line. Uh, so uh, it's about, uh, again, it means that uh, it's not law enforcement that helps. Uh, and th th that's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, I even skip the, pr uh, the problem that some people who are innocent and uh, were sentenced uh, uh, using these laws. Uh, uh, why I skip it, not because I don't care. <laughs> of course, we, we do care and monitor that. But uh, such cases maybe happen, I don't know, 15 times a year, 25 uh, times a year. Of course, it's many, 20 people who are innocent and uh, sentenced, mostly not imprisoned, thanks God. But anyway, it's much less than the 600, most of whom uh, really said something bad. But my impression is that in most of these situations, there were no real reason to even to open a criminal investigation. Uh, so here I will stop, <laughs> I think. And yeah, now let's uh, move on to the Q&A sessions. And um, I was thinking that maybe I can start up with a question on the uh, public discourses in Russia regarding extremism. So um, as we all know, like in America, you had the uh, previous, previously marginalized discourse, such as, you know, um, racism or, um, you know, ethnic hatred. And, you know, recent years they have been resurfacing in the American society and you, you, you see a lot of groups that were pre previously marginalized, like the neo-Nazi groups in America, they have become more or less the center of detention of the media. And I, my question is, therefore, has there been any similar discourses on political correctness concerning racism or uh, discrimination in Russia? Because back in Soviet era, uh, 
as a matter of fact, I believe the Soviet government tried its best to undermine the rise of extremism. Uh, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the public discourse more or less changed. So I was thinking that maybe you could talk to me about how the dominant, the dominant discourse in Russia changes and how the alternative discourse, which is more of an extreme uh, connotation, challenges the dominant discourse in the public. Thank you. Um, I, I'll try to give a brief answer. Uh, here. It, it's a huge thing to, to discuss about uh, changes of these discourses. But first of all, it's very difficult to compare to Soviet time because we have no sociological data. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing, in Soviet time, any public expression, including expression of hatred, was under very strict limitations. Uh, so we, we cannot know in many cases what people thought and what they would like to say if they could. Uh, so uh, starting from perestroika period and uh, in the beginning of 90s, it became possible. Uh, and at that, at that moment, uh, we immediately started, I mean me, we, I mean the Russian society, started uh, discussing uh, this political correctness things, how can it be imported, let's say, uh, to Russia. But it's not so easy uh, to import such a practice uh, because uh, political correctness, as we know it, it's a tool of self-regulation. And uh, it, if there is no experience of self-regulation in general, it's difficult to implement one certain tool when all others are not implemented. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we even cannot compare ourselves to the United States if we talk about uh, self-regulation. Maybe we can more or less compare ourselves to such European countries like Germany or France. Uh, but even, even, even comparing to them, uh, it would be a problem to, to, to make it here. And now, as I said, uh, we again have a censorship uh, which exclude, excludes uh, any, not all, but most of discriminatory language from most official levels of discourse. Uh, so, we, 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 in fact, we do not know what will happen if this censorship disappears tomorrow? Uh, what will we hear from TV if, if it's not regulated this way? Because uh, if, uh, you know, it's, it's usual uh, on, the, on the level uh, of private persons, it, it's, it's normal, for example, to write in the, it's, it's a common example, in, um, when people announce that they uh, give a flat for rent, uh, they write that only for Slavic family, something like that. Uh, and, uh, and, and there are no protests against that. It's, it's, a, it's a, kind of, a kind of common sense. Uh, and uh, also it's a kind of common sense that there are such, such things which cannot be written in newspaper. Not because people do not think that, but because they know but that's not for newspaper, that's only for private sphere. Uh, well, what it tells us, uh, in fact, about... Is it also a kind of political correctness? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes it's just censorship, or both. <laughs> I don't know. So, I have two questions, and the first is, when you've compared the numbers of uh, hate speech crimes, you've said that uh, in Russia it's um, much more high than in other U European countries, but can't it be just because Russia is much bigger? I mean, <laughs> uh, in population. Mm. Uh, if you compare uh, these crimes per uh, some number of citizens, will it be so different? Uh, yeah, yes, it will. 
first of all. But the problem is that uh, when we say that uh, people are sentenced, let's say, for racist statements, yes, most of these 600 people annually were sentenced for some more or less racist statements. But uh, uh, believe me that if somebody was sentenced for certain video, for example, uh, which he published or mostly republished in the Vkontakte network, uh, if, if you know the video, this certain video, you can easily find 100 other copies of the same video. Uh, and other 100 persons were not prosecuted. Why? Because the first one was the most dangerous? Of course not. Just because police in his town ha had something against him, mostly. Sometimes he was, could be chosen randomly. There are such stories. But mostly because he is a local activist, mostly nationalist activist, if he puts racist video. Uh, and local uh, anti-extremism unit decided that it's time to do something with him. Uh, it's a different approach from police. They even do not, uh, they open the case not because something happened, but because they, they have to do something with certain person. That's, that's the key difference. Mm -hmm. And the second question was, uh, is there any research on whether these uh, practices, because I think that uh, the law practices uh, and the um, they're basically fined or imprisoned uh, when they commit such crimes. Uh, and where I, I wanted to ask whether this helps at all, because um, if you hold some, uh, if you hold some strong beliefs, uh, and I think that most nationalists. Uh, are quite strongly convinced in their beliefs. Um, it wouldn't change their minds, just uh, make them more Careful. frustrated about the government and more radical, maybe? Um, if we talk about hate, about speech, uh, if we, because if, if it's about hate crimes, uh, uh, maybe it's, uh, what I have to say, it's rather cynical here. Uh, people are imprisoned for hate crimes because it's a violence, usually a rather serious violence, and they, sp they spend some years in prison. Does it make them better? I think not. But uh, these crimes are mostly committed by young people. Almost nobody leaving prison after 22 returns uh, to street to commit uh, violent hate crimes. That how it ha helps. <laughs> uh, it, it, th that's a practice. Uh, if we talk about speech, uh, of course it's different. First of all, most uh, the imprisonment is very rare. Uh, now it's more frequent than previously, but anyway, it's about few cases. Uh, mostly it's a fine or a suspended sentence, or communal work. Uh, of course, it doesn't change their mind, uh, sure. Uh, it may, these people may be more careful, and they could decide that it's better to, to stop. Sometimes they can be radicalized, for sure. Uh, uh, so, generally, I am not sure that uh, law criminal law enforcement against incitement helps, as average. Um, no, in fact, we have no any criminologist research here. We have some research on uh, uh, people uh, convicted for hate crimes and imprisoned. Uh, this group was more or less researched. But people co convicted for uh, incitement we're never a subject for such research, so we, we cannot say scientifically, but my personal impression that it doesn't help. Do we have any last questions? Sure. Um. Thank you very much for this lecture. 
um, so how we see from your statistics from the first table, um, the most vulnerable groups are people from Central Asia and from the Caucasus. Um, in case of Caucasus, they are not even like migrants, they are citizens of Russia. Nonetheless, like ultra radical nationalist groups define them as foreigners and it means nationalism in Russia mostly based on ethnicity, not on citizenship or political affiliation. However, we see that there is a decrease of number uh, of ethnical crimes towards those groups in past 10 years. And don't you think that it happens because the Russian government um, took control under nationalist movements through proposing the concept of Ruski Mir, or Russian world, and change the vector of nationalist groups from ethnical aspects uh, to political confrontation with the West. That the, the West is the main, like, uh, the enemy, not the migrants, because they uh, have, like, uh, Ruski's world values or something like that. Don't you think that there is connection between these two things? Thank you. Mm. Uh, first, about Caucasus, a uh, group of uh, which we use people from Caucasus include both people from Northern Caucasus and for Southern Caucasus, so they can be citizens or not. Uh, because uh, we, uh, how we classify? We classify the same way as perpetrators do that, because they do it visually. They do not ask documents uh, who is Russian citizen here and who is not. They just attack people because they are black color or because they are from Caucasus. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that in the beginning, uh, people from Caucasus were the main target, and then people from Central Asia took this first place, let's say. Uh, and there were at least two reasons for that. First, uh, growing migration from Central Asia, so it was, let's say, easier to find a victim. Uh, and another thing, uh, I, I hear based on reading some charts between uh, nationalists, that they believe uh, their own mythology. They believe that people from Caucasus are much more dangerous. Uh, so if you attack them, uh, some vengeance may happen. Uh, and, but people from Central Asia are seen as an easy target, uh, which is mostly true because uh, mostly they, they are on a very low social level, which itself uh, makes them more vulnerable. Um, uh, about, I, I would say that all numbers decreased for reasons which I, I explained. Is it related somehow to, uh, let's say, state nationalism? Uh, it's, it's difficult to say. Of course, uh, the government compete independent nationalist movements, let's say, trying to promote its own nationalism as which is better, supposedly better than ethnic nationalism of uh, radical groups. Uh, but anyway, violence is perpetrated only uh, by rather radical people, just because it's risky. So uh, those guys who follow, I don't know, Motherland Party, or some other pro-Kremlin organization, they just do not take risk, they won't attack mostly anybody, except of several, just a couple of uh, special groups who, for some reasons, have a permission to attack political opponents. Uh, they do it, nothing happens to them, but it, it's not a wide practice. So it's a, it's a strictly regulated activity. <laughs> uh, no, if, if usual nationalist would try to, to follow the example, he will be in prison very soon. Uh, so, uh, this anti-Westernism does not produce a street violence itself. Of course, something may happen, but it, it's not about numbers. Mm. So, from this point of view, official nationalism is better, <laughs> I would say. And maybe there are other criteria, but if just to count victims, it's at least inside country. If to count victims outside country, it may be different. I guess we are done with the questions. Uh, if we have any uh, other uh, following up remarks or questions here, so we'll be happy to have it uh, during a, a 10 minute brief break. And then after that, we start with uh, 
uh, Janet, who is going to talk at length about the European mechanism on the subject of uh, uh, hate crimes and the set of rules and regulation that basically restricts the citizen to go for this downhill path. So we take a 10 minutes uh, brief break. Please be uh, strict with your time and be back and we will start the second part of the session. Thank you.